Salam Sajatra, Tena Koto Kato, warm greetings, everybody, and uh, a special thanks to Rector Professor Zulfiki Razak and his wife Mazra, and thank you for the wonderful hospitality you always extend to us. And uh, warm greetings, my co-presenters, Halid and uh, Professor Bud, and also Dr. Ratnawati, thank you very much for your careful guidance of this process, and warm greetings to you all. Uh, may I also greet your waters and your mountains, and I bring greetings to the Oranga Asli people. Uh, of course, and also an acknowledgement of Māori as indigenous people of Aotearoa in New Zealand. So, as one coming from Aotearoa, I come from the other side of the water continent, from Professor Budd. Uh, it's amazing how um, we see these, this vast ocean of the Pacific as joining us rather than as separating us. And we're very thankful that in Malaysia we have actually come together in a, in a quite a physical way. So, and uh, maybe I should pause for a moment. Halij, I'm delighted to know we both have five children, <laughs> which I hadn't realized. And I'll leave the numbers, um, but my grandchildren are Māori, Iranian, Ecuadorian and French. So I'm waiting for a Malaysian one. <laughs> um, this is, uh, my work is probably really, despite all those introductions in philosophy of education, and in particular working with a slight re spelling of the word responsibility, because we want to emphasize not so much the liability of responsibility, which in English that tends to be evoked, uh, but to consider the relational depth of responsibility. And by the way, a lot of this, um, I'm delighted to have a Nietzschean scholar in the audience, because this may be more possible for you to follow it. Uh, however, uh, our interest in responsibility comes in the context of liberal values, which are not only, we can't even say they're Western anymore, they're because they're pervading the global economy. Uh, in Malaysia, I would suggest that your plurality uh, and your values and principles in education provide some kind of vanguard against the marketization of education and of this, the dualistic system that under, underlies liberal values. However, I know that we share a British colonial influence. So I think it's relevant for us to address this, and I've seen it in Professor Rosnani's paper on education as well, where this is a concern. And so some of the value, some of the principles that are embedded in, um, sorry, I better not forget my slides. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a summary. Some of the principles that are embedded in this liberal system are, of course, the privileging of the individual and self-interest, and the value of freedom, private property, autonomy, are, of course, deeply embedded in this system, and I would venture to say even rights, because it's a system that externalizes what doesn't benefit the transactional system or the economy. And so there's had to be a way of accounting for those externalities, which we're now recognizing to be the environment, poverty, inequality, 
and rights have been introduced into the liberal system to allow for some way of minimising the negative effects of that exploitative system. I think one of the speakers yesterday, I was trying to understand the Malay language with the occasional reversion to some English, spoke about cognitive dissonance. And I think this is very much part of what is in this system of externalising what doesn't belong to the transactional economy. It's hard to um, just check here. I haven't got too many slides because some of this is too difficult to, to um, put into a few points. But we do, in particular, see this in climate change and in, in the extremes of inequality that are being that are evident now in all the, all countries that have adopted this neoliberal system. And of course, we also see the divisions in education. We see it in the separation of the disciplines. We see it in the inequality of outcomes that I'm sure are in all societies, but certainly in our society, Māori have been far more marginalised from education success. It's the same with Pacific Island people. And we see it in our prison systems where in New Zealand, Māori are 15% of the population and they're 50% of the people in prison. So this is a colonial system that is still very functional. I'm going to um, use a backdrop to some of this thinking of climate change because, of course, we're now on a trajectory where our planet is under serious uh, issues of survival. Well, I suppose the planet will survive, but the question is many humans won't survive and many plants and animals won't survive either. There will be a whole readjustment of the planet. Uh, but the recent IPCC report, the 1.5 degrees, was largely pushed for it in, the para, in the climate negotiations in order it, through Pacific people because it's Pacific islands that are most at threat of being inundated. So I'm not going to um, read out this detail, maybe you can see it, uh, but you can see that we're on this tremendous trajectory of carbon emissions which is going to cause sea level rise, loss of biodiversity, and also enormous poverty because poorer people are the most unable to respond to or to adapt to climate change. So you can see there, I, I'll just say the IPC, this current IPCC report, sorry, I can't quite see the thing from here. I might have to do this. Um, Climate change, they make a focus that climate change represents an urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human societies. But maybe we could rethink this and, and be thinking human societies represent an urgent and irreversible threat to climate change and to the planet. So this brings us much more to the location of responsibility. And I always find this a extremely valuable orientation to climate change because one degrees or 1.5 degrees doesn't sound very much. But our planet has been in a stable climate era for 10,000 years within a plus or minus two degree range. So this means, oh, I didn't know that this was working. <laughs> This means that a one or two degree change makes the, the planetary ecosystem unrecognisable. And we're already one degrees above 
the, the temperature of 1850. So this, uh, you can see here the trajectory. The Holocene, this 10,000 years, has been the period that has enabled humankind to settle, to form an agricultural base and to create the civilizations that we've created. But we're now taking the climate into a tra trajectory that we probably don't know what the results will be. So this gives uh, us kind of an urgent backdrop to uh, thinking about responsibility. Uh, right, I, I'll have to follow this. So thinking about what we are, I'm just framing this section as thinking about our irresponsibility. We now have to think, how do we address this? And Pope Francis, did a very beautiful uh, piece. You may be familiar with his um, Laudato Si. I don't know whether that makes its way into um, Malaysian knowledge, but, but it's very deeply part of Western Roman Catholic thinking. When he says, we're not faced with two separate crises, one the environment and the other poverty or social but rather with one complex crisis in which, which is both social and environmental, and that is to hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And so uh, in education, I just want to make the step into how do we deal with all this in education? Because clearly, Education is one of the most important areas for, for preparing us to deal with these combined crises. And so we can see that our current model is too often based on separating things. And we see it in the separation of the disciplines and in the, and in the inequality of outcomes. So we see the separating of different fields of knowledge, values from techniques, abstract knowledge from knowledge formed through experience and separating the past, present and future. So in our globalized world, we and in a world where we're facing climate irresponsibility, we are now facing our common destiny and we are recognizing that in fact we live in a woven universe. This is a Maori uh, image for the way everything is interrelated and interconnected. And when we think responsibility a little bit more deeply, thinking of it as a relational value, we see that it, it arises from our concern for others in a very primary way. And there, um, there's a, quite a bit of philosophical thinking that before we become rational and conscious, we are relational. And we can first of all think of simply of a mother and child. You cannot see one without the other. This is the beginning of relationality, perhaps. Perhaps this is a way of imagining that we are relational more than we are individual. Because this is an effort to see responsibility not just as a kind of a legal and accountable concept, but to see it as the basis of our relationality. We have, uh, of course, also the bigger picture concepts of responsibility where we're now facing our responsibility to future generations in a way that we haven't really had to think about so consciously. In the West, we haven't, I should say. It's a very deeply embedded orientation of indigenous cult cultures. So could relationality be a deeper way in which we can address some of these separations, separations in knowledge, separations in the economy that is allowing us to destroy the earth. So I'm going to um, move to some more 
philosophical premises for thinking about, about relationality. And I'm thinking of the work of Emmanuel Levinas. I don't know if any of you know that. You might be more familiar with it. It's not, not such a commonly studied philosopher in our part of the world. But fundamentally, the idea of us being connected primarily to others is expressed in our capacity to, the, to respond to the need of another. And we see this in our great religious traditions that call us primarily to respond to our neighbor or the stranger. And it's not just literally the neighbor and the stranger, but it's a, a relation that comes out of our face-to-face -face encounters where we see the other in terms of our response, our ability to respond. And so we see this often thought about as a face-to-face -face relation where our primary orientation is to the other rather than the orientation of our self-interest. This is a very different orientation from one where we privilege freedom and self-interest because it actually puts a break on freedom. If I give primacy to responding to your need, my freight freedom is in, some, in many ways limited by exercising that responsibility. And it's being thought, we're, think, we're thinking it through in terms of this very material, one-to-one, face-to-face relation as the ground from which we may take this into society, into law and education. And in teaching terms, this idea of being face-to-face, -face, me being face-to-face -face with you, it also invites me into being willing to be taught by you. The assumption is that I cannot know you, but I can be taught by you. So that we're always part of a world that's beyond knowing, like even the other person in many ways is beyond knowing. And it changes our kind of conquering or, or the dominance or, or the, the idea of grasping knowledge into receiving knowledge and then being responsible from what we are given and what we are understanding from that. It's an orientation that is much more about listening it's about respecting the difference of the other rather than assuming that we, not, we can bring people within our understanding or our consciousness. And it's in our fulfilling our responsibility or my responsibility to you that becomes the ground of justice. Now, I'm going to invite you into a rather imaginative space here because it's very easy to think of the human other. These two images here are both faces, and they're both faces in, uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. When I tried to think of how to represent this idea of a face-to-face -face relation and the and the invitation into a teaching relation on the assumption of the other's difference rather than their unknowability, I began to think of Avatar. I wonder how many of you have seen the film Avatar. It's an, it was uh, made in New Zealand and it's really symbolic of indigenous people's struggle to preserve lands and forests and so on, against the power of colonization. If you haven't seen the movie, then this won't make sense to you, I'm sorry, except that this is a very, it's a face 
that we kind of recognise, but it's also unrecognisable. It's that idea of perhaps we're strange to each other more than we, more than we might think. So I'll just leave you with that uh, to play with. Um, but the other picture here, image here is the Whanganui River. And the Whanganui River is a legal person. This has been uh, broken amazing legal ground in New Zealand because it's come about through the, the endeavour of Māori to recover authority over their natural resources. That's, uh, that's all been taken through colonisation. Land was taken and the rivers were taken as well, which was extremely foreign to Māori, uh, Māori thinking or Māori law. And so there's been a kind of settlement or an agreement to acknowledge that the river is a living ancestor. And in law, it is now a legal person. And the name of that person is Te Awatupua. And that person has all the rights, duties, and liabilities of a legal person. So this has been very innovative law in New Zealand, and funnily enough, it's been very quickly followed in other countries. The Ganges, part of the Ganges has been made into a legal person. And in Ecuador and Colombia, there, some of the forests and rivers have been made into legal persons. We don't know whether it's going to have an effect of being beneficial to the river, but there, there are guardians to speak for the river, one Māori and, the, and one representative of the Crown. So I, I thought this is a way of showing how much things can change and how we are beginning to see environmental uh, formations as, as what we are deeply interconnected with. They're not other, they're, we are part of them, and they are part of us. Is that the next slide? So uh, I think it's always important to say that responsibility is very much aligned with indigenous ways of thinking. In fact, whenever you hear traditional indigenous people, it's always framed in terms of obligation. And there, this may, it will be an image that's known to you, many of you who've come to Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is a porphyry where there are protocols of welcome of the guests to facilitate this face-to-face -face relation in a very material setting. And if we were having this conference in a building like that, in a marae, uh, we would be sitting around in a great big circle, maybe lying on mattresses and talking to each other in a very different kind of style. And this is becoming more and more common in New Zealand. Uh, I don't think we need to... Sorry, I'm just not sure if it keeps jumping. No. Oh. It doesn't, I don't need it too much. It's just the images is, is sometimes quite nice. It's, it's about number 10, I think. Um, so I wanted to pause for a moment because I read some of um, Dr. Rosnani's paper on education in Malaysia. And I could see that, in essence, it was about two streams of education here, the Islamic stream and the national curriculum, or the national education system. And the, the issue seemed to be how to achieve, how to build national unity when you have such a pluralistic system. And I found this extremely interesting because it was very much I think the thinking is to find commonalities in order to find our basis for difference. 
However, if we thought about these two streams in terms of a face-to-face -face relation between these streams, and how could one bring responsibility to the other, this would be a very different basis for commonalities, and it would mean not excluding the difference of the other. It would invite a dialogic process because ethical work is very much procedural work. And so I, I wondered about something that we've, we're starting to use, which is a system of round tables. Yeah. Uh, and if, if we have round tables where we bring forward a teaching relation, a listening relation, rather than looking so much for commonalities, would this be a basis for an ethics that accommodates our differences, but because we are working with responsibility, we are able to respect the other in their differences rather than in their commonalities? And um, so we might ask questions of how could we invite those of Muslim faith to support other faith tra traditions to fulfill their commitments to revealed knowledge. Now, you may have, you will have much more profound questions that of responsibility. How could we respond with responsibility to the other rather than try and just find our sameness is uh, the kind of orientation I'm thinking of. And um, in New Zealand, we are having these round tables. We're in the process of developing policy on relational well-being. And we also are working with this, I heard it yesterday, the, these uh, ec economists, Amiata Sen and um, Fatusi, and who are articulating what is well-being globally but they still have very individualized premises in the economic systems. So we had a round table with our Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet on what is relational well-being, and basically nobody knows. We don't know how to express it because all our assessments and measures are based on very individualistic on individual assessments. How do we experience well-being? Not on how are we connected together as the real basis for our well-being. Like family relations are part of well-being, but you can't measure them. And so is love and those other kinds of issues. So we are also trying to find what this might mean. and. In that, in a round table kind of policy environment, we might be able to work with responsibility to counter dominance, to counter these drives towards kind of colonizing knowledge that, and colonizing economies that's very much coming through some of these, the, the, the global kind of systems that we're wanting to be part of. So I'm um, just sharing this as a, a, a groundwork for a very different orientation of developing knowledge, developing policy. And I'm slightly suspicious of all our talk about sustainable development because I wonder if we're simply mapping the idea of sustainability onto an underlying system of separations. And I wonder whether this face-to-face -face orientation of responsibility gives us a deeper orientation to a transformational pathway. So I think I will leave it at that for now. Thank you.